is NASA's launch coverage of the double asteroid redirection test. In a galaxy where asteroids have pummeled planets for billions of years, now one planet strikes back. For the first time in our planet's history, NASA will test an asteroid deflection technique. It's the first planetary defense method of its kind. NASA's double asteroid redirection test will intentionally ram itself into an asteroid and alter its orbit forever. At the crossroads of science fiction and reality, DART is part of our plan to defend planet Earth against potential future impacts. The test to protect the future of our planet begins now. And in less than an hour, this SpaceX rocket will launch the DART spacecraft on a six million mile head-on collision course with a near-Earth asteroid. Welcome, and thank you for joining us here inside the NASA hangar at the Vandenberg Space Force Base on the central coast of California. I'm your host, Daryl Nail, and joining me is Kelly Fast. She is a program scientist with the Planetary Defense Coordination Office. Welcome, Cle Kelly, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Daryl. It's fabulous to be here, uh, helping to cheer DART off the planet. <laughs> now, right at the top, let's talk about this. Are there any asteroids threatening Earth that we know of. Now, thankfully, there are no known um, asteroid impact threats to Earth. You keep tracking them. We don't know of any. It's the one that's, that we don't know about, that we're concerned about, but that's why NASA surveys for near-Earth asteroids, searches for them, and does a test like DART to have that in the toolbox. Okay, and this asteroid DART is going to hit. What's the story there? Well, the asteroid Didymos does not pose an impact threat to Earth. It keeps its distance, stays like, it gets no closer than 3.7 million miles to uh, Earth's orbit. But that's what makes it a fabulous uh, test uh, situation for DART. We can go safely test an impact, uh, the kinetic impact technique, uh, and, and Didymos is the perfect laboratory for that. Okay, and this spacecraft, is, is this something that could one day save the planet? Well, what's nice about this, I mean, it's a nice mature technique, kinetic impact, you just impact something, but now we're actually going to test it. So this is gonna be really good to have something in the toolbox that we've actually tried, uh, taking it from modeling to an actual test. Well, it is certainly exciting just to hear you talk about it. And when that moment happens in the fall of 2022, when that impact happens, that's gonna be quite a moment. It's gonna be amazing. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. And there's so much more to discuss about asteroids, planetary defense, and the DART mission, so let's get right into it with a quick breakdown of the DART spacecraft. DART has a mass of 670 kilograms, about a golf cart size or vending machine size uh, machine. It uses hydrazine thrusters for propulsion and roll out solar arrays for electric power. Now, DART has just one instrument on board, and there it is at the bottom, and that instrument is a Draco camera, which will feed images to an autonomous navigation system, steering it smack dab into an asteroid. Now, here's how DART got here. It was pulled by this semi-truck 2,900 miles across the country from the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland, all the way here to the Vandenberg Space Force Base. It took the team 46 hours to make the trip. You see that box right there? That's the protection protective container that was removed and is being stored here in the NASA hangar while this DART spacecraft was carefully prepared for the launch and then put into that protective fairing. What a beautiful shot that is, Kelly. And then earlier this month, engineers mated the DART spacecraft inside its protective fairing to this SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, which you see here, and DART's at the top of the rocket. It was then rolled out to the launch pad at Space Launch Complex 4 East, where it is now awaiting liftoff at 10.21 p.m. Pacific, 1.21 a.m. Eastern Time. Now, as we follow pre-launch operations, we also have some cool stuff to show you along the way. Our own Kelly Fast will give a fun demonstration. <laughs> there she is. She's going to help us visualize a close approach asteroid. And she's moving quick. We'll also head into space where two astronauts will demonstrate in microgravity the kinetic impact technique that DART will be using. And also, this is kind of fun. We'll hear from a Hollywood director, Adam McKay, about his new science fiction comedy, Don't Look Up. It's about an Earth-ending comet that he'll compare with reality. But first, 
It's T minus 45 minutes and counting. Let's get our first check on launch operations and introduce our launch commentators for today, NASA's Marie Lewis and Denton Gibson. Marie, preparations have been going on for many hours. Where do we stand right now? Uh, well, at the moment, Daryl, everything is still go for launch. Uh, we listened to polls just a few minutes ago internally with the spacecraft team and NASA engineering. Uh, no red flags, everything looking right on course. I uh, want to introduce uh, our commentator who's making his debut uh, launch commentary tonight, Denton Gibson with the Launch Services Program, your mission manager. No stranger, certainly, to Falcon 9 and uh, missions like this, but this is your first time in the commentary booth, so welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's launch day, so I'm looking forward to this. And the uh, teams on console have been uh, going through their steps methodically uh, since a little before 7 o'clock this evening Pacific time. There is a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket at Space Launch Complex 4E uh, here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. And in less than a minute, we expect to hear the NASA launch manager, Omar Baez, uh, pull the NASA team uh, for launch readiness and uh, readiness for propellant load to go ahead and proceed with that. Uh, if, that all, if that is all go, uh, that will begin at T minus 35 minutes. All right. And the reason why you hear this poll at this point in time, because there's so much going on much later in the the process so they try to have it have the poll early so that way the team can focus on the telemetry and focus on the data coming from the rocket and really pay attention to everything that's going on leading into those last few minutes we're just standing by for that nasa this launch is manager NLM poll. on the nlm net with our uh, propellant loading uh, poll starting with nasa ce nasa ce is go sma sma is go SMD. SMD is go. NASA mission manager. NASA MIM is go. LSP. LSP is go. Teams ready to proceed in the cryo tank. So what you just heard was the NASA launch mansion polling the various NASA teams to make sure that they're ready to go uh, to proceed with propellant loading and, and launch. And Launching a rocket is very difficult because it takes multiple teams to do that. And that's the various teams that you heard the NASA launch management pull in to make sure that they're ready to proceed with the count. One thing I want to point out as we look at the rocket live on the pad on a, an unusually clear night here at Vandenberg is the soot on the side of the rocket. And that is because this booster has already been flown twice, in fact. But this is the first time for a launch services program mission. That's correct. We've done a lot of work getting to this point where... We've we've comfortable where we are with this, and we're looking forward to this launch. And this is we have very a lot of familiarity with this booster because we actually launched this the first for the first time on Sentinel Six almost a year ago today. Yeah, so happy anniversary, Sentinel Six, and we're getting ready to fly this booster once again on a, a SpaceX's first interplanetary mission. So really exciting stuff coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, weather is 90% go, so things are looking really great here so far. Daryl and Kelly, for now, we're, we'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Marie and Denton, and so that's a great report. They're fueling up the rocket. Mm -hmm. Kelly, it's getting kind of exciting. I'm really relieved to hear that report that, uh, that it looks like things are going to go. And I think of the DART team. I mean, they've been working on this for years, but they've brought a spacecraft to the launch pad through a pandemic. And so they really need to be commanded. That's a great point. And you are right about that. Astronomers now all over the world. What's interesting to me about this is after this impact happens, they'll be able to see some kind of change. Right. It's a unique mission in that there's an astronomical component to it when DART impacts uh, the moon of Didymos, Dimorphos, in fall of 2022. It will change the orbital period of that little moonlet. Uh, but from the Earth, it's just a, uh, a point of light, but that point of light varies in brightness because that moonlet travels in front of and behind Didymos. And so that can be measured, and that rate of that light going up and down is what they're going to measure, the change in that. And that's how we're going to see exactly what DART did to Dimorphos. That's fascinating to me because it's literally just light you're looking at. We've never seen this little moonlit, but we see the light and that's how we gauge it. More stuff to come from Kelly. Thank you very much. We are T minus 41 minutes and counting. Here now is everything you need to know about the DART mission. DART stands for the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, and the DART mission is to basically go hit an asteroid and see if we can move it. 
Earth is surrounded by small objects called near-Earth asteroids, and some of them are potentially hazardous. So planetary defense is cataloging, figuring out where all these objects are, but also trying to prevent them from hitting the Earth. So far, we've only been able to predict the impact of two or three objects ahead of time. Those objects were small enough, they burned up in the atmosphere, and they were no danger to anyone. But what happens when an asteroid or any object is going to impact the Earth is that the Earth and that object want to be at the same place at the same time. We can't change the speed of the Earth, so the idea would be to change the speed of the impactor. Now, we chose to do this demonstration at a binary asteroid. The main asteroid is called Didymos, and its moon. DART is actually targeted to the moon of the Didymos system. And that's a much smaller target than any spacecraft has ever managed to hit before. This is the first mission to fly the next sea. There's the ROSA, the solar arrays have an Italian CubeSat, but it's really all about smart navigation. The DART starts out with the traditional mission design concepts where we use star trackers and optical navigation. This will be the first time that the spacecraft will autonomously guide to a target. The narrow angle camera will be used by the spacecraft to home in on the target and hit it. And then the CubeSat will fly past the target and it will return the data directly to Earth on its own. The tough part about it is that we're guiding ourselves into the asteroid, we're taking pictures, and we're sending data back all at the same time. You know, Didymos is a system that is tightly locked together, so we're going to try to push on the little moon and try to push it away in such a way that it will change the orbit of the asteroid and it will move it. Mostly what we're looking to do is change the speed of the incoming object by maybe a centimeter per second. So that's not very fast, but if you do it enough seconds in advance, you can cause it to miss the Earth entirely. DART is actually the first planetary defense mission. This is a continuing series of missions for planetary defense. We had this unique opportunity to demonstrate the method and also to learn exactly what happens when you crash a spacecraft at high speed into an asteroid. While the launch and spacecraft team are busy preparing for liftoff, the mission operations team located across the country in Laurel, Maryland, is preparing to communicate with the DART spacecraft after an hour-long flight on a Falcon 9. Let's bring in Samson Rainey now to find out what they're working on. Hi, Daryl. I'm at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, which has a number of historic milestones in space. We're talking about the first mission to orbit Mercury, the first flyby of Pluto, and of course, here we are uh, with our next major milestone with DART. Right now, I'm standing outside a missions operations control, which is essentially the nerve center for the spacecraft after launch. It controls everything from propulsion to the power supply. Let me give you a quick lay of the land here. If you look behind me in this corner, there is a U-shaped configuration that's called the command pit, and it houses the flight controllers as well as the mission operations manager. Now flanking the command pit on either side are the consoles for the subsystem experts. Right now, the team is basically looking at their consoles and making sure all systems are green or a go for launch. Now, it might seem like quite an uneventful scene in the back, as you're seeing right now, but I spoke to Ray Harvey earlier, he's the mission operations manager, basically in charge of the overall health and functioning of the spacecraft. And he said that uneventful, or dare I say boring, is exactly what we're going for in this final countdown to launch. Um, so there's a lot going on here, and what's going to happen is What's cool about the spacecraft after launch is that there are a number of pre-programmed and automated sequences that will occur. So about an hour after launch, the spacecraft will separate from the launch vehicle. At this time, the spacecraft will be in a rapid rotation. So at that point, thrusters will engage and fire and bring that spacecraft into stabilization. They call that detumbling the spacecraft. Now after the spacecraft is stabilized, the next part of the automated 
automated process happens, which is the um, unfurling of the ROSA solar arrays. Now remember, each array is 28 feet long, so it's gonna be an intricate multi-step process to bring DART's wings to spread. And so that probably will take two hours alone for that process to happen. So after the spacecraft goes through those automated sequences successfully, the team will then take control of the spacecraft. Um, navigation systems will be engaged, and the team will then bring the DART spacecraft to a default orientation, which includes most critically making sure that those solar rays are pointed toward the sun and gathering energy for the journey. So as you can see, a lot is gonna happen tonight, and so the team expects a graveyard shift. Um, but stay tuned because later on in the show, we're gonna come back and talk to some of the engineers and scientists and learn more about the mission. So stay tuned. Thanks, Daryl. All right, time to turn our attention to a critical component in the pre-launch operation, and that's the weather. It was a beautiful day today on the central coast of California, and fortunately, we also have a beautiful launch weather forecast. So let's take a look at the satellite, and you can see the clear areas we shift from day into night. Um, that's California in the center, of course, and that peninsula there, that's where we're launching the rocket. There are clouds to the north and to the west, but the area around the central part of the state where we are fairly clear with only some high cirrus clouds from a weak cold front that did move into the area and lower the temperatures here. Now, the Space Launch Delta 30 launch weather officer, Max Rush, says that this will bring elevated winds both on the ground and in the upper, upper atmosphere. So they are watching those closely, but overall, take a look at this launch day forecast. It is nearly perfect. 90% go. The wind is 18 miles per hour. That is the gust out of the north northwest temperature down to 48 degrees so it's a little chilly out there uh, the concerns are winds and offshore clouds as you saw some of that cloud cover over the Pacific now the space launch Delta 30 weather team will be monitoring all of those winds and conditions as we move forward now the winds and the winds on the ground and the winds up in the upper levels of the atmosphere. This is always being monitored by the Space Launch Delta 30 team. And to do that, meteorologists will use a weather balloon. And they invited us to watch and participate in that release that helps inform that launch weather forecast you just saw. Mike Schmeiser, Daryl, meteorologist of the Space Launch Delta 30. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So what do you do here? This is the nerve center for weather forecasting. There's uh, about 240 sites just like this across the United States. And every day, twice a day, all of those sites release a balloon. So we're putting out the data for not only National Weather Service, but also for our forecasters. Absolutely critical. It takes about five minutes for that data to come in. And this is the wind speed and direction so I understand you're going to be releasing a balloon in just a few minutes? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I've talked to the guys out there and they said uh, you're good to go to be the guy to release it. You're going to trust me with the weather balloon? I trust colonels with weather balloons, so I'll trust you. <laughs> All right. Here we go, 10 seconds. I feel like the biggest hit of the park. Perfect. Interesting fact about that balloon you just released, mm -hmm. when it gets up to 100,000 feet, it'll be about the size of a Greyhound bus. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for having us out here. Really yeah. enjoyed it. I'm really glad you came out. Thanks. It took me back to being a kid and just <laughs> releasing a balloon into the air. Thank you to the 30th for doing that. Now, most of the spacecraft NASA builds are intended to operate for many years or even decades, but not the DART spacecraft. It was built to be destroyed. So let's check in now with Raquel Villanueva, just uh, about five miles away from us at a launch viewing location with more. And Raquel, looks like you got a little bit of a crowd behind you. <laughs> That's right, Daryl. There is a crowd of about a couple hundred people behind me getting ready and braving the chilly temperatures to watch this launch. And right next to me is DART Deputy Mechanical Engineer Lisa Wu to talk about how the spacecraft was built. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Thank you for having me. So explain to us how DART was built and tested and designed. That is a great question. So DART was built from the inside out. We started with components on the inside 
side, including boxes such as our avionics that had the smart nav system, mm -hmm. our algorithm built by APL. Woo! Um, that's basically what's going to autonomously take us to the asteroid. So once we tested everything on the inside, we closed up the box and we started doing everything on the outside. So we installed and integrated our solar arrays, our ROSAs, um, as you will roll out solar arrays. Um, and then at that point, afterwards, we put on our Nexi engine, which you can see here in the video. Uh, that is our Nexi ion thruster, which is pretty cool. We closed up the spacecraft with blankets to keep the spacecraft nice and warm. And from there, we had to take it through a series of very vigorous testing, including vibration testing and thermal vacuum chamber testing. All of this was really cool. One of our last things we installed was our Leecha cube from our Italian friends. And then we put it in our shipping container and shipped it from Maryland all the way out here to California. Right now, it is on our rocket, and we are ready to launch. And what was the biggest challenge the team faced when building the spacecraft? You know, I think the biggest challenge that we faced was definitely having to build a spacecraft under the constraints of a pandemic. That was super difficult, because building a spacecraft in itself is hard. But with pandemic and all the restrictions, it was really hard. But, you know, the team adapted. We we did things very virtually, we did procedures online, we did shift work, and in the end, the awesome team we had made a spacecraft. So, hey, that's why we're here today. Great, it's great to see you here now, and i just like to thank you for your time today, Lisa, and I will send it back to Daryl. Kel and Lisa, thank you both so much. DART will take flight on a pre-flown SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 4 here at the Vandenberg Space Force Base. But once again, this pre-flown booster will make another return from space. For more on that, here's SpaceX engineer Jesse Anderson. It was almost exactly a year ago when the Falcon 9 booster set to carry NASA's DART mission first took flight. On November 21st, 2020, at 9.17 a.m. Pacific Time, Falcon 9 lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base here in California, carrying the Sentinel-6 Michael Freelich mission for NASA to its targeted orbit. Following that launch, the Falcon 9 booster returned to Earth for a land landing on the pad just adjacent to where it had lifted off from roughly eight minutes earlier. This same booster recently flew a Starlink mission in May of this year from our Space Launch Complex 40 pad out in Cape Canaveral, Florida, landing back on our drone ship, just read the instructions in the Atlantic Ocean. Now today, this booster will make its third flight from the pad where it all started with the launch of NASA's DART mission. Roughly two and a half minutes after liftoff today, the Falcon 9 first and second stages will separate, and the second stage will ignite its single Merlin vacuum engine to carry the DART spacecraft to an interplanetary trajectory. The DART spacecraft will separate approximately 56 minutes into flight and spend the next 11 months cruising to its intended destination. Following stage separation, the first stage will make its way back to our autonomous spaceport drone ship called Of Course I Still Love You, which is currently stationed off the coast of California. Now keep in mind, it can be tricky to maintain the video feed as the booster makes its way back to Earth, but fingers crossed, we'll get some great views as it completes its third trip to space. That's it from us here in Hawthorne. Now back to you in Vandenberg. All right, thank you very much, Jesse. And now time to check back in with the launch team at the Mission Directors Center to see how the countdown is progressing. Maria and Denton, that booster looks very familiar. I was out here a year ago, and it looks great on the pad, though you can tell it's been to space. Yeah, you sure can, and and that's what we like to see. Um, you know, the, the the reuse is is so exciting. Um, and Denton, I know you talked about this already being a first for the launch services program, uh, but you really were able to get a lot of insight from the reuse that you saw with. Uh, cargo missions and the commercial crew missions for NASA and so uh, just building upon that and, and it's really great to see there's a live look again at the pad and now we can see the liquid oxygen venting off the side of the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, fueling began about nine minutes ago and uh, so if the, the count has been uh, really quiet these last few minutes and that's a good thing. Yeah absolutely I mean that's what you want. You want an uneventful count that means everything is going well we're moving along in the count progressing and being where actually we're supposed to be at this point in time. So that's what we want to hear. And 
liftoff is scheduled for uh, 10, 21, and 2 seconds p.m. Pacific time. So if you are watching from the East Coast, it's going to be uh, already early uh, the next morning. And uh, there is a special reason why SpaceX fuels this close to liftoff. Yeah, and that's because they use densified propellants, which are very, very cold. And so they fuel this close because they don't want it to warm up too much. Um, and you want to keep it down in those really cold cryogenic temperatures prior to liftoff. And SpaceX has gotten very good at that, at fueling this late in the game. They're very efficient at it. And... It's just a normal part of the process at this point. All right. So we're going to continue to keep an ear on things. Uh, next thing we'll be listening for is the SpaceX uh, launch conductor pole at T minus four minutes. That's the next milestone you see on that progress bar uh, on the bottom of your screen. So we'll be listening in for that. Um, and for now, we're going to toss it back over to Daryl and Kelly. All right. Thank you very much, Marie and Denton. And now we want to get back to the science of this mission and talk a little bit about the what if, Kelly. You know, um, this is a big deal. A lot of people probably haven't heard of this. Like, oh, wait a second, should I be worried about you know, asteroids now? But um, it really comes down to all the documenting and cataloging that you guys are doing. So how many asteroids uh, are out there? Right, well, NASA-funded telescopes are responsible for most of the near-Earth asteroid discoveries, which now number 27,532, according to the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies website. Okay, <laughs> well, and that's an up-to-date number. It is. So what about the asteroids that we don't know about? Well, that's the thing of the uh, the subset that are of a larger size that could really do damage uh, that the Earth's atmosphere doesn't protect us from. Uh, that larger population, we've probably only found about 40% of those. Only 40%? Which means there's a lot more out there. Mm -hmm. So we keep searching. Okay, well, we keep our eyes to the skies and eventually get a telescope up there, right, to, to look at this. Right. NASA you know, funds these ground-based telescopes that uh, search for near-Earth asteroids, and they're doing a fabulous job, but it is also developing the Near-Earth Object Surveyor Mission, uh, which will be a space-based infrared telescope really designed to do this type of survey work and accelerate the rate of discoveries of near-Earth asteroids. Space-based telescope specifically purpose for looking for asteroids. Right. Looking forward to that mission. And so what if there was enough time, though, to knock it off course. Well, earlier, NASA's Raquel Villanueva talked to two key people about how FEMA and NASA are working together on this. While there's currently no threat of an asteroid or comet heading toward Earth, there is plenty of work being done to prepare for a potential threat. I'm here today with NASA Planetary Defense Officer Lindley Johnson and Leviticus Lewis with FEMA to talk about some of the measures being taken. Leviticus, Lindley, thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, how do your agencies work together when it comes to planetary defense? Well, we at NASA are tasked with uh, trying to find any impact threat that might be out there, any asteroid or comet that is close enough to Earth uh, that it could impact us, uh, and uh, uh, then be able to determine when and where that impact might occur so that we can inform the emergency response community if we don't have enough time to do something about it in space. FEMA is the federal interagency coordinator and also an all hazards organization. So planetary defense is just one more thing on our list of hazards that we should be prepared for. One of the many emergencies. Now, Lindley, if there were to be an asteroid that posed a threat to Earth, um, what is being done to discover and track this? Well, NASA and the Planetary Defense Coordination Office sponsors projects around the country at observatories and, and uh, university space institutes uh, that are searching the skies uh, every night to uh, find any asteroid or comet uh, that could be an impact threat to the Earth uh, in the future. We want to find them uh, far enough in the future that we have a chance to do something about them, uh, like use DART to deflect them uh, off uh, of that impact trajectory. Uh, but if uh, the time is short and we're not able to do that, uh, then uh, an asteroid impact is just like any other natural disaster. And so the emergency response community needs to know when and where and what the effects could be. And if an asteroid posed a significant threat, what steps would be taken next? 
Well, uh, we collect uh, as much information as we can about the asteroid uh, through the uh, remote observing and determining the composition and size. Uh, it might be small enough that Earth's atmosphere would disintegrate it, uh, but if not, then there could be uh, damage uh, at the surface. We want to be able to appraise the emergency response community, how extensive those uh, effects might be, what kind of uh, area uh, might be uh, impacted uh, by, uh, by this natural disaster. And Leviticus, how would FEMA work with NASA if this type of scenario were to happen? So we're not going to be changing our procedures exactly, but we want to make sure we account for the differences in the science and in this particular scenario. So it will be another emergency added to the list of things we handle every day. Leviticus, Lindy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you're quite welcome. You're welcome. All right, DART is the first time we've ever used a spacecraft as a kinetic impactor into an asteroid. So we asked the astronauts on board the space station to demonstrate what a kinetic impact looks like in space. Hi everyone, I'm Thomas Pesquet and I'm with my favorite astronaut Shane Kimbrough uh, up here on the space station. Uh, today we're going to talk about a very cool new NASA mission, it's called DART. Can you tell us and tell me a little bit more about what is NASA's DART mission? Okay, yeah, so DART is NASA's first planetary defense test. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna try to do something we've never done before uh, with a spacecraft. And the, now the purpose of this spacecraft and this mission, it has one purpose, and that's to crash itself into an asteroid and try to redirect it or try to move it into a different orbit. So today, Shane, uh, we're going to demonstrate some of those principles uh, that you laid out before. Um, but uh, can you tell us exactly how we're going to do that? Uh, we're going to try to demonstrate this, this asteroid kinetic deflection method, um, which is really the moment that that, that spacecraft crashes into the asteroid. Um, so here we go. Shane's going to be the asteroid. Um, and I'm going to be the NASA DART mission. Um, I'm going to try to throw this CTB and we'll look at the effect of that mass coming at him and the kinetic energy transfer. Shane will be perfectly stable. <laughs> you ready? All right, here it comes. <laughs> Directed chain successfully. <laughs> Pretty good. A while ago, we, we uh, got out the door and we got some new solar arrays here on the space station. And so the same technology we have here now on the space station is going to be used to power the DART mission on its way to this asteroid. IROSA, um, in case you didn't know, but you knew, um, it stands for ISS Rollout Solar Arrays. So we got a chance to go outside and install the very first two of these new IROSAs, or Rollout Solar Arrays, on the very end of the space station, out on the... DART is SpaceX's first interplanetary launch for NASA and the first planetary defense test to see if humanity can change the motion of an asteroid in space or stop it altogether. As part of NASA's larger planetary defense strategy, the DART mission will prove that a spacecraft can autonomously navigate to a target asteroid and intentionally collide with it, a method of asteroid deflection known as kinetic impact. The target asteroid, which poses no threat to Earth, is the asteroid moonlet Dimorphos which orbits a larger asteroid named Didymos. If all goes as planned, DART will direct itself to impact Dimorphos at roughly 15,000 miles per hour or four miles per second, which is six kilometers per second, just under a year from now, somewhere between September 26 and October 1st of 2022. Scientists will use telescopic observations of the asteroids, images taken by an onboard camera, images of the DART impact event collected by an Italian Space Agency CubeSat and data collected later by the European Space Agency's HERA mission to build a more accurate model and better prepare us to successfully defend the planet should a future asteroid impact threat ever be discovered. The DART mission is an awesome example of science fiction becoming reality and the SpaceX team couldn't be more excited to be launching this payload to space. We will learn more about the DART mission later on in the broadcast, but first, let's take a closer look at the vehicle on your screen. 
Now, as many of you may know, on your screen is a live view of our Falcon 9 launch vehicle. Our, our, our two-stage liquid-fueled launch vehicle is in position at Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Today marks the 26th mission for SpaceX this year and 128th flight of a Falcon 9 vehicle overall. This is SpaceX's first flight proven launch for NASA's launch services program. This first stage booster supported Sentinel-6A around the same time last November and took its second flight on a Starlink mission in May of this year. Now, if you're new to our webcast or unfamiliar with Falcon 9, what you see at the bottom two-thirds of the vehicle are SIP markings from its previous two flights. These markings are located on what we call the first stage or the booster. And the first stage's primary role is, a, is to accelerate the vehicle all the way to the edge of space with the help of nine Merlin engines. It will then drop off the second stage carrying today's payload, which is NASA's DART or Double Asteroid Redirection Test Spacecraft. Now, following separation from the second stage, the first stage will make its way back to Earth for the third time, where we will then attempt to recover it on our autonomous drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, and that is a live view of that drone ship right there on your screen. Now, if you turn your attention to the section above the first stage in the black carbon fiber inner stage, you'll see Falcon 9's second stage. About two and a half minutes into flight, the first and second stage will separate, and the second stage will ignite its single Merlin vacuum engine to carry the DART spacecraft to an interplanetary trajectory, as I mentioned earlier in the webcast. Separation from the second stage will occur, and then the spacecraft will perform burns as it begins its journey in space. Now finally, above this stage, placed at the very top of the vehicle, you'll see the nose cone structure, and that is called a fairing. Inside of that structure is the DART spacecraft. The two fairing halves are safely encapsulating the spacecraft to protect it from aerodynamic heating, loads, and contamination during ascent. The fairing halves we are using today are brand new, and we plan to recover them on our recovery ship, NRC Quest. Now, once the vehicle reaches the vacuum of space, we will jettison the fairing halves as the second stage continues on its journey to orbit. Good evening from Hawthorne, California. I'm John Isbrucker, the Falcon Principal Integration Engineer. And a launch vehicle and spacecraft are in good health and ready for launch as we approach T minus 13 minutes, 30 seconds to lift off. The Falcon 9 team reported on console at T minus two hours, 15 minutes. We received the final countdown briefing from the SpaceX launch director, and we began the final checks of the launch vehicle and the ground systems. Final check out of the flight termination system was performed at T minus one hour, 45 minutes. Now, most recently, we completed the poll to proceed with propellant load and launch. Propellant loading is ongoing. We started it on time at T minus 35 minutes. Now, Falcon 9 is a bi-propellant vehicle, meaning it uses two propellants, a fuel and an oxidizer. For Falcon 9, a fuel is a refined form of kerosene known as RP-1. Now, to burn the fuel, we need a source of oxygen, which we call the oxidizer. Most burning on Earth uses oxygen, which makes up about 21% of the air you breathe. However, in space, there is no atmosphere to provide oxygen or other oxygen-bearing molecules, so rockets need to carry their own. Falcon 9's oxidizer is super chill liquid oxygen called densified LOX. The liquid oxygen is chilled well below its boiling point to increase its density, and that allows us to load more into the first and second stage LOX tanks. Now currently, fuel loading is complete on the second stage. We're continuing fuel loading on the first stage up until T minus six minutes. Liquid oxygen is loading on the first and second stages right now. Now in addition to its propellants, Falcon 9 also needs an ignition source to start burning the fuel and oxidizer. And for that, we use the chemical T-tub, which stands for triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane. We ignite the engines by first flowing some liquid oxygen and T-tub into the gas generator and the main combustion chambers. The T-tub burns in the presence of oxygen. So once we get that ignition, then we can introduce the RP-1 kerosene fuel and the Merlin engine goes to full power for liftoff. Now at liftoff, Falcon 9's two stages combine to hold over 1.1 million pounds propellant. And we'll burn through most of that over the eight and a half minutes it takes to land the first stage and get the second stage into its initial orbit. 
Now once our Merlin engines begin to burn the RP-1 kerosene fuel and the liquid oxygen, you're gonna see the rocket essentially throwing the combustion exhaust out of the engine nozzles in one direction, resulting in a push on the rocket in the opposite direction. And this is the great example of Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now we started the day with pretty good weather forecast and the good news right now is weather officers giving us a 0% probability of violating launch weather requirements. The ground level winds are good, the upper altitude winds are good, and we don't expect to have any weather holds for launch. The weather conditions also look good for booster landing on our drone ship and for fairing recovery in the Pacific Ocean. So with that, the launch vehicle, the spacecraft, the weather, and the range are all good to go for a 10.21 p.m. Pacific Time liftoff from Space Launch Complex 4 East. Liftoff of Falcon 9 will kick off a roughly 11-month journey for the DART payload. The DART spacecraft will separate right around 56 minutes into flight, and from there it will spend the next 11 months cruising to its intended destination, intercepting the binary asteroid system between late September and early October of 2022. DART's target asteroid is the size of two football fields. Impact will occur when the distance between Earth and the asteroids is near its minimum within 6.8 million miles or 11 million kilometers of Earth. This will enable scientists to observe and measure the change in momentum of the Dimorphos asteroid. And it's worth noting that Dimorphos is not a threat to Earth. Therefore, it's a perfect testing ground to see if intentionally crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid is an effective way to change its course should an Earth-threatening asteroid be discovered in the future. Now the DART demonstration has been carefully designed with four key objectives. The first objective is to demonstrate a kinetic impact with Dimorphos, the smaller the two asteroids. DART will hit the asteroid nearly head on, delivering enough energy to leave an impact crater, but not enough to destroy the asteroid, eject it from its orbit around that larger asteroid, or noticeably change the pair's orbit about the sun. Now the second objective is to change the binary orbital period of Dimorphos. Now the orbital period is the time it takes the smaller asteroid to circle the larger asteroid you can see here in the graphic. Currently, Dimorphos is in that original orbit. Scientists estimate the collision will shorten the smaller asteroid's orbital period by several minutes, placing it into that new blue orbit. Now the third objective is to use ground-based telescope observations to measure the orbital period change before and after the impact. Telescopic observations in the weeks after impact will confirm that DART changed that orbital period of Dimorphos and it'll reveal by how much. And then finally, the fourth objective is to measure the effects of the impact and the efficiency of that deflection. Now choosing this binary asteroid target for the demonstration takes advantage of the fact that changes in that smaller asteroid's orbit around its larger partner can be more easily measured than the changes in a single asteroid's orbit around the sun. To ensure the best possible data capture, the DART mission is taking along some pretty cool technologies to help capture this demonstration test. On board the spacecraft is the Didymos Re Reconnaissance and Asteroid Camera for Optical Navigation, also known as DRACO. Now, this is not to be confused with the DRACO thrusters on SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft. DART's DRACO will provide real-time streaming images of, asteroid, of the asteroid as it approaches impact. In addition to the onboard camera, the team is also flying a CubeSat from the Italian space agency known as Licia Cube, which stands for Light Italian CubeSat for Imaging of Asteroids. This cube will be deployed from the DART spacecraft 10 days prior to impact with, with the asteroid. Licia Cube will use its onboard propulsion system to alter its trajectory, offsetting so that it flies past Dimorphos approximately three minutes after the DART impact to capture the effects of the impact. Now it's pretty incredible to think about what a mission like this could mean for the future of planetary defense. Now let's take a closer look at what the NASA team is hoping to achieve with the double asteroid redirection test mission. In case there was an asteroid coming towards Earth and you're there, you can actually stop it. I mean, 
That's kind of fantastic. NASA is crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid. What? You think science fiction, but this is real. Never in my life would I have thought I would take a couple hundred million dollar spacecraft and crash it into an asteroid. <laughs> my name is Michelle Chen. I'm Lena Adams. My name is Kelly Fast. I'm Andy Rifkin. I'm Justina Sorovitz, and I help tell the story of the DART mission. I'm a planetary defender. And I study how the orbits of asteroids change after we hit them with spacecraft. My job was primarily to make sure all the systems on the spacecraft work together. The DART mission is NASA. NASA's first test of a uh, planetary defense technique called Kinetic Impactor. DART is the double asteroid redirection test. It's just a spacecraft that is going to go and smack an asteroid. The moon lift Dimorphos, which orbits the asteroid Didymos. And see if we can change its trajectory just a little bit. In order to show that we can deflect incoming asteroids if we need to. DART will only be changing the period of the orbit of Dimorphos by a, a tiny amount. But in space, just a little bit. Is just enough to make an asteroid actually miss us. In the event that an asteroid is discovered well ahead of time before it might impact Earth. Well, behind me, you see the spacecraft. It's really cool to see it coming together in real life. It is fantastic to see it in real life. To see it turn from ideas into real pieces that are going to go into space. The solar arrays will actually roll out to 28 feet in length. Once the solar arrays are deployed, it's going to be the size of a school bus. As the solar array opens out, it's going to swing out in this direction. The asteroid's only two football fields in size. We're flying at over six kilometers a second. 30 days out, we see one pixel on our field of view. You can see Didymos and Dimorphos as one point of light. About four hours out, our spacecraft becomes autonomous. And then that's where everything gets really exciting. You actually are seeing impact. We're super excited and nervous as well. I feel really honored and humbled to be working in an area of science that has such a broader impact, you know, figuratively and literally. <laughs> so dark. The dinosaurs are made completely extinct by an asteroid impact so many years ago. Here we are, we can actually do something about it. I think this is just wonderful. It's currently T minus four minutes and counting. Everything continues to be go for launch. Spacecraft is transferred to internal power. Now on your screen, you can see the large structure next to the Falcon 9. That's the strong back. Currently, the clamp arms have opened up, and you can see that the strong back has begun to retract away from the rocket. It's moving all the way back to a launch position about 77 degrees upright. Now, this is different from Falcon East Coast launches where we move the strong back only two degrees and then we retract it the rest of the way at liftoff. At Slick 4, once we get it back into position here in about another 40 seconds or so, we won't have to move it farther away at liftoff. Also, while we are watching the video, we have completed the fuel load on the first stage on time as expected and we've begun chilling of the Merlin engines. Coming up on T minus three minutes, everything continues to be go. Stage one, locks load complete. And we just heard that call out, locks load complete. That is the first stage locks loading being completed. Second stage will complete around T minus two minutes. And Falcon 9 and DART teams continue to track no issues for launch. Weather is still looking great, as John mentioned. The range is ready to support. And SpaceX team is monitoring the completion of that second stage. Uh, coming up next, around T minus two minutes, we should hear locks loading complete for that stage. Now, as a reminder, we do have, if we do uh, have a hold on today's launch for any reason, we do have a backup opportunity tomorrow with a liftoff time of 10.20 p.m. Pacific time, just a minute earlier than tonight. Coming up on T minus two minutes, waiting for the call out that locks load is in closeout. Stage two locks load complete. There we go, stage two locks load is complete. This completes loading of the over 1.1 million pounds propellants on the Falcon 9. All systems remain go for launch. 
Now the SpaceX ground computer is now draining propellant out of the lines that go up the strong back to the second stage, and that creates the white cloud that you see around the strong back. Pressure from the ultra cold liquid oxygen line is being vented, and that causes moisture in the California night air to condense. Next event will be the startup call out at T minus one minute. The first second stage computers on Falcon 9 will execute programs to prepare the rocket for flight, leading to ignition of the Merlin engines at T minus two seconds and liftoff at T zero. Falcon 9's in startup. There's that call out. Falcon 9 computers are now running the final sequence for launch. First and second stage tanks are beginning to final pressurize for launch. Just waiting Falcon for. Falcon 9, start, go for launch. And there's that final go for launch with all systems for go for T0. Let's listen into the terminal count and watch Falcon 9 transport NASA's DART spacecraft into orbit. Two minutes, 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Mission. On the way for humanity's first ever planetary defense test mission. Vehicles pitching downrange. Stage one chamber pressure is normal. T plus 33 seconds, SpaceX launch engineers seeing a nominal conditions on Falcon 9 as we begin the trip to space carrying the DART spacecraft. M1D engines about to begin throttling down. Power and telemetry nominal. We're throttled down. Avionics calls out good power on the vehicle. Vehicle is supersonic. Max Q. We've gone supersonic. We're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. And the Maryland 1D engines have throttled back up to full power. We're out of the throttle bucket. From here on, even though the velocity is even though the velocity is rapidly increasing, the atmospheric density is decreasing, and so the loads are decreasing now on the Falcon 9. Everything continues to look good with the stage one trajectory. Invec chill has started. The lead valve is open on the second stage engine. That's beginning the final chill prior to second stage engine ignition. Two minutes into flight, all continues to go well. In 30 seconds, we'll have three significant events coming up in quick succession. We'll get Miko, main engine cutoff, where we shut down the nine Merlin engines. The stages will separate and we'll get ignition of the MVAC-D second stage engine to power DART and the second stage into their parking orbit. We've throttled down to hold at four Gs, getting ready for Miko. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. In that ignition. We've got successful stage separation. Second stage engine ignition now at full power on the Merlin engine. Next event coming up is going to be payload fairing jettison. On the left side, you can see the titanium grid fins on the first stage beginning to deploy as we get ready to bring the first stage back down to the drone ship, of course I still love you, in the Pacific Ocean. Getting ready now, there's fairing the view. Separation confirmed. Of the fairing. And we've got deployment of the payload fairing 
And now the DART spacecraft exposed to the vacuum of outer space. Now we will be attempting to retrieve these new fairing halves with the help of our recovery vessel, NRC Quest. Stage two on nominal trajectory. Everything going well with Falcon 9 and DART. What you're looking at on your screen is a live view of that NVAC engine on our second stage. Burning bright, we are currently in the first of two planned MVAC burns for spacecraft deployment today. At T plus six minutes and 40 seconds, uh, you should see on your screen, hopefully we'll get some live views of the first stage uh, entry burn. And that entry burn will last about 30 seconds. Now for the entry burn, we do relight the center E9 engine and then partway through we relight the E1 and E5 engines so that we have three total M1D engines helping to slow the vehicle down as it passes back into the Earth's atmosphere. And again, what you're looking at on your screen is the MVAC engine on the second stage, getting some awesome live views and everything is still looking nominal for stage two. At T plus five minutes into this mission, we're just under two minutes away from the entry burn on the first stage as second stage is continuing on its journey. Again, this is the first of two planned MVAC burns for this mission. Now the Falcon 9 booster supporting today's mission will perform this entry burn for the third time because it's previously supported Starlink mission earlier this year and the stage two on nominal trajectory. Just to call out that stage two is looking nominal, which is great news. Uh, the first stage booster, again, supported a Starlink mission earlier this year and the Sentinel-6A mission in November of 2020. Now, both fairing halves for this mission are brand new and will be recovered for the first time on a recovery vessel, NRC Quest. We are just about 30 seconds away from that entry burn on first stage. As a reminder, the Merlin engines on the first stage are optimized for sea level, and these do achieve 190,000 pounds of thrust during ascent and descent. And it looks like we've got a live view on your left-hand screen of the first stage. Stage one, FTS is saved. Stage one, entry burn startup. And we heard the call out as well as visual confirmation that the entry burn has begun on the first stage. Again, this is about a 30 second burn and just helps to slow the vehicle down as it's re-entering the denser part of the Earth's atmosphere. One entry burn shut down. And as you could see, the engine shut down on your screen. We did hear a call out that entry burn is complete. Stage two FTS is saved. Stage two continues on a nominal trajectory. Now coming up in just. Terminal guidance. Just a little over a minute will be Seco 1. That is second stage engine cutoff 1. Again, there is two burns for the MVAC engine on the second stage, so we are in the first burn. Expected loss of signal, Cook. So we should see this engine shut off here shortly. And about 20 seconds later, we'll see or hear the landing burn call out on first stage begin. MVAC shut down. And 
we just Nominal had orbit insertion. That's what we were waiting for. Stage one, landing burn startup. So we got Seco one on second stage. We got a confirmation of good orbit and the landing burn has begun on first stage and now we have a live view of first stage making its way to, of course, I still love you. Stage one, landing leg deploy. And we had some incredible views. Now we're just waiting for some confirmation of that first stage landing here in a second as we have a live view of second stage currently with the engine cut off as it's coasting towards its targeted uh, orbit. And we will wait for that confirmation of that first stage landing, but uh, you have just witnessed Falcon 9's 26th uh, flight for this year. Um, and we will confirm once we have uh, that confirmation for that first stage landing. So now at this time, our mission isn't over just yet. The second stage is now embarking on its first coast phase. Coasting in this orbit will last about 20 minutes and we will light that MVAC engine for a second time shortly after T plus 20 28 minutes and 38 seconds. So we'll see you back here at T plus 28 minutes. McKay, director of Don't Look Up. Our movie is about three scientists who try desperately to warn the planet of an impending doomsday comet and are ignored. Our movie's made up. It's a comedy. But in fact, the brilliant scientists at NASA are actually launching a mission. It's called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And what they're going to test is, can you send up a mission that can deflect an asteroid and steer it away from Earth? If God forbid bid something like that were ever to happen remember to keep an eye out for it it's going to be spectacular Thanks to Adam McKay of the soon to be released science fiction comedy, Don't Look Up. Folks, we are back inside the NASA hangar. And though the movie is not real, the double asteroid redirection test or DART is real. And we are ready to show you every aspect of this mission with the experts who know. So welcome up back everyone. I'm Daryl Nail and with me is Kelly Fass, program scientist with the Planetary Defense Coordination Office. We hope you really enjoyed watching the launch. I know Kelly did, because as it was going up, you were going, go, go, pump in your fist. <laughs> <laughs> that was so exciting to hear the rumble of the, uh, uh, of the rocket noise come through the hangar here, but then just, again, being so excited for the team that has worked so hard on this. I know they are partying it up uh, wherever they're watching from, and so especially, I'm so excited for them. <laughs> yes, especially that launch viewing location out there. I heard that it was a fantastic view, mm -hmm. and uh, that was pretty neat to see at least the first part of the landing where it was coming down, illuminated the ship. But right. even more so to see that dark spacecraft and the fairing come come out, there it is, going to space. Oh, it's, I, I know we're not out of the woods yet. We still got to get that all the way out to Dimorphos, but this is a huge step along the way. Absolutely. That is very important because there is a lot more work to do to get this. And of course, we're going to be tracking all of that. Um, you know, going back to that movie trailer, you know, mm -hmm. Hollywood's always had fun with asteroids and, you know, ending the Earth <laughs> with one of them. <laughs> but... Um, the movie's called Don't Look Up, but really, you're kind of evidence that we're looking up more now than ever. I like that Adam McKay kind of put it into context that it's fiction, it's a comedy, but you know, in the real world, there's a lot of work going on with a lot of scientists. Uh, looking for near-Earth asteroids, getting them cataloged. Uh, there's an inter international asteroid warning network. There's astronomers around the world doing this, and it's, it's a big focus at NASA. And so uh, it's the only natural disaster that we could prevent, an asteroid impact. And so why not use your capabilities to look, you know, to the extent that you can, rack those up, and then 
do something like darts that you've got a tool in, in the toolbox there. Absolutely. And there's so much more to talk about. You know, there are other ways I've heard that we could do this. This is one we're testing. We'll talk to Lori Glaze about that. And then we'll also uh, have your close approach demonstration, <laughs> which we're look, really looking forward to. So that's coming up in just a bit. So in the next hour, we are going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about asteroids and break down the DART mission from A to Z. And we're going to start with an overview of this mission. In case there was an asteroid coming towards Earth and you're there, you can actually stop it. I mean, that's kind of fantastic. NASA is crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid. What? You think science fiction, but this is real. Never in my life would I have thought I would take a couple hundred million dollar spacecraft and crash it into an asteroid. <laughs> my name is Michelle Chen. I'm Lena Adams. My name is Kelly Fast. I'm Andy Rifkin. I'm Justina Sorovitz, and I help tell the story of the DART mission. I'm a planetary defense. Fender. And I study how the orbits of asteroids change after we hit them in the spacecraft. My job was primarily to make sure all the systems on the spacecraft work together. The DART mission is NASA's first test of a planetary defense technique called kinetic impactor. DART is the double asteroid redirection test. It's just a spacecraft that is going to go and smack an asteroid. The moon lift Dimorphos, which orbits the asteroid Didymos. And see if we can change its trajectory just a little bit. In order to show that we can deflect incoming asteroids if we need to. DART will only be changing the period of the orbit of Dimorphos by a, a tiny amount, but in space, just a little bit is just enough to make an asteroid actually miss us. In the event that an asteroid is discovered well ahead of time before it might impact Earth. Behind me, you see the spacecraft. It's really cool to see it coming together in real life. It is fantastic to see it in real life. To see it turn from ideas into real pieces that are gonna go into space. The solar arrays will actually roll out to 28 feet in length. Once the solar arrays are deployed, it's going to be the size of a school bus. As the solar array opens out, it's going to swing out in this direction. The asteroid's only two football fields in size. We're flying at over six kilometers a second. 30 days out, we see one pixel on our field of view. You can see Didymos and Dimorphos as one point of light. About four hours out, our spacecraft becomes autonomous. And then that's where everything gets really exciting. You actually are seeing impact. We're super excited and nervous as well. I feel really honored and humbled to be working in an area of science that has such a broader impact, you know, figuratively and literally. <laughs> The dinosaurs are made completely extinct by an asteroid impact so many years ago. Here we are, we can actually do something about it. I think this is just wonderful. And as was mentioned in there, this is the first planetary defense mission. And this is your office we're talking about, Kelly. So for the audience out there that, that doesn't understand or hadn't heard of this before, what is the Planetary Defense Coordination Office? What do you do? All right, well, NASA's actually been working on near-Earth asteroid research uh, since 1998. So this has been going on a long time. Hmm. But uh, in 2016, it was really formalized more in the creation of this Planetary Defense Coordination Office which is in the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters. And it takes that legacy near-Earth object observations program, all the, you know, the finding them part of the program, and then combines that with these other activities like DART, like the development of the Near-Earth Object Surveyor Space Telescope, like our interagency uh, collaborations like we saw with FEMA there, uh, our international collaborations, and formalizing all of that and uh, leading the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, uh, Lindley Johnson. We say he's got the, the coolest title in the solar <laughs> system as NASA's planetary defense officer. <laughs> All right, and he sure does. I enjoy listening to him in that interview earlier. Now, throughout the show, we will be taking the most popular questions NASA gets about asteroids and posing them to experts like Kelly. This next question is for NASA expert Marina Brozovich. When was the last time an asteroid hit Earth? 
Well, the answer depends on whether you're asking about small or large impacts, because Earth gets hit all the time. But luckily for us, the vast majority of these impactors are small, and they just burn in the atmosphere. The most significant fireball event in over 100 years occurred over Russia in 2013. We actually got hit by an asteroid that was the size of a small building, and that one disintegrated about 20 kilometers above the city of Chelyabinsk, and it deposited a fair number of meteorites in the ground. And I happen to have a piece of that Chelyabinsk impactor right here in my hand. But what about big impacts? The ones that leave craters tens of kilometers wide and cause huge amount of devastation. We have to go far back in time for such an event. And those old craters are not easy to spot, because by now they're heavily eroded, they're filled with sediment, or they can be at the bottom of the ocean. But to keep the long story short, small impacts, they happen all the time, especially given that about 15,000 tons of space dust get Earth every year. And large impacts are rare, and we're talking millions of years rare. So when was the last time an asteroid hit Earth? Probably today, but the odds are it was very small and just burned in the atmosphere. The binary asteroid system DART is taking aim at was chosen for many reasons. Let's join Raquel Villanueva with a special guest to explain that. But first, Raquel, you saw the launch in person live. What was that like? Ooh, it was chilly with lots of excitement and lots of cheers, lots of fun. And I am here with DART program scientist Tom Statler to talk about the double asteroid mission. Like, what did you think of launch, Tom? Oh, Raquel, it was a beautiful, beautiful launch. <laughs> Tremendously exciting. <laughs> now, can you tell me why uh, the asteroid was chosen? Oh, well, a binary asteroid system and the Didymos binary asteroid system is the perfect natural laboratory for the double asteroid redirection test. For one thing, the larger asteroid makes sure that the smaller asteroid is held in orbit around it, so there's absolutely absolutely nothing that we can do that would make this asteroid a danger to the Earth. But more important, it's about the measurement. We need to be able to measure how efficiently DART deflects the asteroid. And we're using that binary orbit of the little asteroid around the big one to do that. We're going to change the period of that orbit by just a few minutes, and we're going to be able to measure the size of that change using telescopes on Earth in the weeks and months after impact and de precisely determine exactly what it was we did. Now, DART is called a kinetic impactor, which is intended to change the orbit of an asteroid. So what kind of mass and speed is needed to alter the orbit of this particular asteroid? Well, the DART spacecraft weighs about 500 kilograms, uh, which uh, Andy Rivkin, uh, one of the IT, one of the uh, investigation team leads, said the other day is about the mass of a small cow, which is, I guess, true. And it's going to be impacting the asteroid at a speed of about 15,000 miles an hour. So at that speed, it covers the last four miles to impact in one second. Now, that's going to deliver enough of a push to the asteroid to change its motion by a fraction of a millimeter per second. But it is more than just the push of the spacecraft. It's also the energy released in that tremendous collision at 15,000 miles an hour. Uh, now we can envision the small cow. Now really quickly, how do you measure success for this mission? Well, success is, of course, first, we want to execute the kinetic impact and, and strike the asteroid. But success is really being able to see the magnitude of that change. And at the end, when the observations are done a few months after impact, having that measurement and knowing exactly how much, how efficiently we deflected the asteroid, and then later with additional data being able to put that in context and knowing what we might have to do for a similar asteroid or a different asteroid in the future if we ever do need to deflect one. Tom, thank you so much for answering our questions today. My pleasure, Raquel. I'll send it back to Daryl. Thank you, Raquel and Tom. And so now I have a clear picture of the size, vending machine, golf cart, and cow. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, crystal clear now. Well, from time to time, you'll hear a report about an asteroid making a close approach to Earth. As my co-host Kelly Fast shows us, a simple demonstration with a basketball, an orange, and a tiny pebble can help us get a better understanding of what's a really close approach and what's not. <laughs> 
Well, and here we are. <laughs> here we are, big open field. You know, we're just talking about how uh, you know, sometimes you hear about asteroids that pass close to the Earth, and maybe the, the news will say, oh, there's an asteroid passing you know, 10 times the distance from the Earth to the moon. And I think, well, whoa, man, that's close. Well, yeah, it sure sounds like it, but what does that mean? And, and you found this basketball that looks like the Earth, and so we can do a, a scale model here. So if the Earth was that size, the moon would be the size like of this orange. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it out to where the moon would be if it were this size. Oh, okay. So here we go. Probably about 25 feet, which I paced out earlier. So later. <laughs> <laughs> and so if the Earth were the size of a basketball, then uh, the moon would be out here. And so if an asteroid were passing like at 10 times the distance from the Earth to the moon, you know, it would be <laughs> 10 times out that way. Right. Even probably past the building. But on a cosmic scale, not that far. We still want to keep an eye on asteroids that could come this close. <laughs> But as asteroids pass closer to the Earth, again, they're not, they're not impacting. As we get to maybe this distance, this is about like the distance of the, the weather satellites. That's really starting to get close. We don't want to get you, that close. <laughs> what do you have to, do to show for the asteroid? Well, you know, if you had this type of a scale, an asteroid might be oh. about, in fact, this is too big. This pebble is even too big uh, to represent uh, maybe the, even the asteroid that uh, took out the dinosaurs. Really? Um, yeah. It would probably be smaller than a grain of salt, wow. but we wouldn't be able to see it very well here. So is this a close approach? Um, yeah, we would call that a close approach, but it's not an impact, and so so we're good. Um, and this seems very small relative to the Earth, but it's the speed when they're going very fast. Like, you know, if you've ever been at the beach, you get sandblasted when it's windy. Mm -hmm. It's the speed that uh, added with that sand mass. Can hurt. Yeah. yeah, and so, uh, and that's why you, you get craters uh, on surfaces when, uh, when, when they impact. Our atmosphere does a good job of protecting us uh, disrupting asteroids on the way in but um, if they're large enough then they can reach the surface and do even more damage and so that's why you don't want to find them early then you could do something like the dart mission where you could deflect that asteroid just a small amount and then it would miss the earth as you spun the solar system into the future right well can you take this little asteroid and go out there past the moon sure because <laughs> that just makes us feel better now it's way out. Keeping <laughs> where it should be out here. <laughs> I enjoyed that. That was fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I, I can't believe you found a basketball that looked like the Earth, and it was perfect. <laughs> Specifically for this demonstration. Great job, Kelly. Most scientific spacecraft have lots of instruments on board, but for DART, there's only one. It's the camera on the front, and it's called DRACO, or Didymos Reconnaissance and Asteroid Camera for Operational Navigation. For more about how this camera will help steer DART into the asteroid, let's go out to APL and Samson Rainey. Hey, Daryl. Joining me right now is Tarek Daly, who is Draco's deputy instrument scientist. Um, first, Tarek, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that fantastic launch. It never gets old to watch a NASA launch, does it? It's a stunning experience. Absolutely beautiful, Samson. And congratulations on that first major step of the mission. To the whole team. All right, so I'm going to take us out, way out, to about a month before impact, say. Mm -hmm. And Draco is, you know, first detecting that first spec of light that is in the blackness of space, and it's our target binary asteroid system, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is going to happen with Draco at that moment up until impact? What is it going to do? So Draco is the eyes of the spacecraft. The images Draco takes provide the data needed to guide the spacecraft to hit the asteroid. So beginning about 30 days out, we'll take images every few hours that get processed on the ground for optical navigation. We'll also measure how the brightness of the asteroid changes over a period of several hours because that will tell us more about the relative sizes and shapes of the bodies. Things get really interesting about four hours before impact. That's when this spacecraft transitions to autonomous navigation. At this point, something called SmartNav takes over, which was developed here at Johns Hopkins APL, and the spacecraft now drives itself to the asteroid. The asteroid system at this point is less than a pixel across. It's actually not until an hour before impact that the camera can actually see the secondary asteroid, the moon, separately from the primary asteroid. And it's not even until just 20 seconds before impact that you can see things on the surface the size of the spacecraft. And all this navigation is happening using algorithms on board the spacecraft. Wow, that's incredible. Um, well, 
we are looking forward to those picks when they come next year. So good luck on that, Tarek. Thank you so much, Samson. Tossing it back to you, Daryl. All right, thank you, Samson and Tarek. The DART spacecraft is still flying through space, and we have an important flight operation happening in just a few minutes. So let's check in with Marie and Denton for the latest on that. All right, thank you, Daryl and Kelly. We are getting ready uh, for the second burn of the second stage of Falcon 9. Yeah, and basically what this was happening here is after the coast, it, the engine is going to fire up, and it's going to be a shorter burn, and it's basically going to give us the velocity to, to get out of Earth orbit and, and heading towards the, the Digimo system. And so uh, we expect that uh, second burn to begin at T plus uh, 28 minutes, 31 seconds. Um, so we have a view there now of uh, that is the Merlin, the Merlin MVAC uh, engine on the Falcon 9 second stage. And that uh, second ignition coming up in just a few seconds. Yeah, and as we approach the ground station, the, we're getting better telemetry and video from the vehicle. And from, from there, you can kind of see the trajectory of where we are heading towards right now. All right, well, right now, we're near the, the southern tip of South America. In back ignition. And we just got confirmation of MVAC ignition. And you can see the video there. You can see the engine coming to life. And so we are, uh, right now, DART is near the southern tip of Chile, uh, near the capital city of the area's uh, southernmost region. And so this next burn uh, lasts just under a minute, and then we expect to hear uh, second cutoff at T plus 29 minutes, 27 seconds. So in just a few uh, seconds now, You can see that MVAC engine glowing red hot during the second burn. Everything's looking good. MVAC shutdown. And we just got confirmation of engine shutdown. All right, so that was a that was a pretty quick burn. Yeah. Yeah, and all that, and that was the, just a short burn needed to give it that velocity so it can head towards the Didymos system. Okay, so now we are in a coast phase again. Nominal uh, escape burn. Okay, so confirmation, everything nominal. Uh, there is a view of the, of course, I still love you, uh, drone ship with the the booster uh, safely landed there. That is the third landing of this booster, so congratulations to SpaceX on uh, yet another one. In the meantime, uh, DART is in a coast phase with the second stage for uh, about another 26 minutes or so. And uh, during this coast phase, the spacecraft will fly over uh, the South Pole. Uh, and by the time of spacecraft separation at uh, roughly T plus 55, 56 minutes, um, DART will be uh, near the southern tip of Madagascar. Uh, so we'll be continuing to keep an ear on things. Uh, so far, this has been uh, a beautiful uh, start to DART's uh, journey. It's got 11 months, roughly, to make it to uh, the Didymos system, where it will impact Dimorphos uh, in late September or early October of 2022. For now, uh, Daryl and Kelly, uh, actually, no, we are going to uh, go over to uh, NASA's Megan Cruz. She spoke to um, the Launch Services Program flight design expert about what it takes to design a trajectory uh, as complex and as unique as this one in order to get DART uh, to its very precise destination to impact that asteroid. So let's go over now to Megan Cruz. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you know, I know that you're a flight design expert with NASA's Launch Services Program, and you lead the team who designed DART's flight path. Can you tell me about that flight path, and was it difficult to plot out? Unlike a lot of missions where you have a single 
uh, trajectory that's going to get you to some point in Earth orbit. We're designing a, a new set of targets for the launch vehicle to hit on every single day, up to 90 targets in this case. So um, a fair bit of uh, trajectory analysis, a lot of computer time, and uh, a lot of work by uh, the combined team, both here at NASA LSP and, and our spacecraft partners uh, at JPL and APL, and of course, you know, SpaceX. Mm -hmm. Why the instantaneous window and not the longer window we typically see for scientific missions? When we talk about launch opportunity, that is actually like the number of days that we can launch. Um, and when we talk about launch window, that is the amount of time on a particular day that we can launch. So given the fact that we had 90 days to potentially launch this mission, and the fact that um, you know SpaceX has a pretty good history of launching on the first or second day in the opportunity, we decided that uh, it was more efficient and a better use of the, uh, the again, the limited resources uh, that we all have to, to do these kinds of missions to focus on having the best launch trajectory for each day and if if for whatever reason we weren't able to launch that day we've got another day right behind it. And why did you guys ultimately decide to launch from the central coast of California not here in Florida? Great question. Um, the re typically, uh, for a lot of our interplanetary missions, the most important thing is to get as much energy uh, out of the launch vehicle, uh, and, and, and that's not, no different for DART. However, usually the best way to do that is to launch as close to the equator and on an easterly trajectory. Uh, so Kennedy Space Center or Cape Canaveral Space Force Station would be the ideal locations for that. Um, as it turns out, though, this particular uh, outbound trajectory requires that outbound uh, ground track to be more in a north-south direction and so we're going to launch from the west coast of California and uh, and fly out on a, on a basically a southerly trajectory uh, and that is a much better way to launch uh, to avoid uh, overflights of populated land masses. Yeah absolutely and where will you be and what will you be doing during the launch? So I'll actually be here at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, typically uh, pre-COVID uh, in my role I would be traveling out to the west coast I'll be monitoring uh, the progress of the vehicle during ascent and uh, making regular updates to the NASA chief engineer and uh, right up to spacecraft separation and then I'll be looking at the data from the rocket and uh, making a determination of how well we did and I'm very confident that we're going to hit that orbit uh, very accurately. Bill, it sounds like you'll be very busy during launch. I hope you find some time to enjoy um, what you guys have worked so hard to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Megan and Bill. Planetary defense takes planetary participation. Here's a message now from Administrator Bill Nelson about NASA's leadership in this global effort. At NASA, we are always looking upward, keeping an eye on the sky for potential hazards and exploring asteroids to help us unlock the secrets of the formation of not only our solar system, but the universe. Well, we have a new mission, NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test. It's known as DART, and it's going to help us learn if by intentionally crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid to see if there's any slight change in its trajectory. And this collision will change the asteroid ever so slightly so that if you got it way, way away from Earth, if it was inbound to Earth, you could change that trajectory and it would escape Earth. And what DART's going to do, it's going to ram this asteroid that is an asteroid revolving around another asteroid. It's going to ram it at 15,000 miles an hour and see if we can change that trajectory just a little bit. And DART is not only going to help NASA, but indeed the world, prepare in the event that an Earth-threatening asteroid were to be discovered and we thought it was coming to Earth. So this is important. Go DART. Thank you, Administrator Nelson. Joining us now is the director of NASA's Science Mission Directorate's Planetary Science Division. Let's welcome Lori Glaze to the NASA hangar, who just came from the Mission Control Center. Watch the whole launch. You get to see all the cameras and the computers and everything. So first of all, I want to ask you, how was that? 
It was really incredible, I have to say. Sitting there in the room uh, with the headphones on and you can listen to the spacecraft team as they go through all of their checks and making sure that they've got everything ready to go and all the go for fuel and then watching the, the monitors. You can see the fuel tanks filling up on both of the, the main booster and on the second stage. And then the final pole when you get, you know, the spacecraft teams go for launch and then you hear the launch team say, is NASA ready for launch? And NASA launch manager says, NASA is go for launch. And then I'm going to admit that I snuck outside and oh, watched. You got to go out. And it was amazing. Clear sky. You can see Clear it all the way. Clear sky, lit up behind the hill there. Gorgeous. It's oh, beautiful. it's so fabulous. This is so fun, Lori, because you're my boss, and I get to ask <laughs> you questions. <laughs> well, and as part of uh, your division, uh, Planetary Defense Coordination Office is in there, and you've got now you've got the DART mission. What other missions are under the Planetary Defense portfolio? So, great question. Um, in addition to uh, the DART mission, which we now have just launched, uh, we actually also have a mission I know you've been talking about the importance of detecting and characterizing asteroids. We have a mission that's called the NEO-WISE mission, or the Near Earth um, Object WISE mission, which is a repurposing of the old WISE mission uh, that we actually use to, uh, to do some detection of asteroids, but also a lot of characterization so that we know what the asteroids look like, what they're made of, and what their, or their orbits are. And then we have a new mission that we've just started developing that we're hoping to launch in the next few years um, that's called uh, the Near Earth Object Surveyor Mission, or NEO Surveyor. And, and that mission is going to be really dedicated to looking for those near Earth objects. Um, that'll be its sole purpose. We're going to send it out to a, a stable orbit called a Lagrangian point, L1. Um, should be an amazing mission. And we'll have the eyes in space besides just the telescopes, which is pretty neat. Exactly. I got to wondering, you know, with this kinetic impactor, we're testing that. We'll find out about that in about 10 months. But are, are, do we have any other ways that we're looking at to, to move an asteroid off course? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are multiple ideas that have been thought about and different techniques that have been been, uh, developed and studied. Uh, the kinetic impactor is the, the changing the gravity, gravitational pull. Another idea which is out there um, is to potentially detect, uh, or I'm sorry, detonate a nuclear uh, device, not on the, you don't want to blow up the asteroid. Oh, well, it sounds like Armageddon. No, no, no. Not quite. No, no, you don't okay. want to do that. You want to detonate it near the asteroid to just give it a push. How about that? Fascinating. All technologies you're working on. Lori Gray's Director of NASA Science Mission, Director of the Planetary Science Division, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. All right, so with that, it's time to ask the expert scientists at NASA another question about the asteroids. And this one, folks, this one's for NASA asteroid expert Davide Farnochia. We're going to ask him the question, is NASA aware of any Earth-threatening asteroids? No. There is no asteroid that we know of that is concerning in terms of impact hazard. Now, we know that asteroid impacts have happened in the past and can certainly happen in the future. But we should keep in mind that those are rare events. An asteroid impact that could cause serious regional damage only happens every 2,000 years or longer. Still, it's a good idea to protect us against that possibility. And the rule of the game is find asteroids before they find us. And that's why, for over 20 years, NASA has been funding search programs to observe the sky pretty much every single night to find and track asteroids. And we've been doing a pretty good job at that. So far, we've discovered more than a million asteroids, including 95% of the asteroids that are greater than one kilometer and that could come close to the Earth. Once we discover an asteroid, we project its motion into the future to assess the possibility of an impact with Earth. We have a scale called Torino scale that helps us rank the risk coming from each asteroid. It goes from zero, which is lowest risk, to 10, which is highest risk. And the good news is that for all the asteroids that we've discovered, so far, the Torino scale is zero, so lowest risk for the next 100 years. So, is NASA aware of any Earth-threatening asteroids? No, but we will keep searching the skies just in case. And that's good news. We now heard about the instrument on board a little further back, the Draco camera. Now let's discuss the computer that will use Draco's camera and the images from it to autonomously fly DART into its target. Samson Rainey is back now with us from the Mission Operations Center in Maryland with a special guest to tell us more. Samson? Hey, Daryl. 
Joining me right now is Smart Nav Leave Michelle Chen. Michelle, give us some insights into what you call the brains of the spacecraft. How will Smart Nav allow DART to identify its target and stay on that target for the whole four hours before launch, before impact? Right. So at four hours is when Smart Nav starts controlling the spacecraft. And if you imagine that you're the spacecraft and you're looking at the Didymos system, you're going to see the, the Didymos system and Didymos itself. And at about an hour to go is when the little guy Demorphus starts eclipsing and coming out from eclipse and it is at that point that we start guiding towards Demorphus. Great. And so why did you choose this um, method for the mission as opposed to other alternatives? Um, so this method, it's we kind of need it because if you everyone's been talking about the 15,000 miles per hour, mm -hmm. so that's 250 miles in one minute. Wow. And um, for us to joystick that from the ground with the one minute round trip flight delay for communications, it would be impossible. So we needed something autonomous on board. That's incredible. Um, so how are you feeling right now, and how are you going to feel, you know, when we approach those four hours before impact? Right. Yeah, so APL has a lot of experience on maturing guiding tech technology and smart nav is an irad that we started in eight years ago and um we it's kind of like a child right so we've spent the past eight years training and teaching this child to basically drive the spacecraft on its own and like a parent would say you know during we're going to be sitting in the passenger seat watching our child drive and um, we're going to be really excited and nervous as all heck <laughs> Well, we are rooting for your kid to do really well when the time comes. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Back to you, Daryl. All right, thank you both. And we have a fun way now, a little separation from the serious science, for you to participate in our mission today. And it's by signing up to be a planetary defender, just like Kelly. Here's a look at some of the people who sent us videos on how they got involved. I'm a planetary defender. I love space, and my dog is also a planetary defender. I am planetary defender. Go dog! I'm a planetary defender. I am planetary defender. I am a defender. planetary Cosmo and I are planetary defenders. We're planetary defenders! I'm a planetary defender. Yeah! <laughs> Love the kid with the rocket engines. That was great. <laughs> yeah. If you would like to participate in being a planetary defender, there's a website. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's at dart.jhuapl.edu forward slash planetary hyphen defender. Again, that's dart.jhuapl.edu forward slash planetary hyphen defender. And there's a five question quiz. And then if you do well, you'll receive a digital certificate so you can share it on social media or, you know, hang it on your wall. So guess what? Daryl and Kelly took the quiz. We did. <laughs> and we, we have our certificate. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, yeah. I am officially declared a planetary defender on NASA's double asteroid redirection test. I am so, proud of you, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. That means a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you took the quiz, right? And you passed. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of funny because I started working my way through the quiz and I knew what the answer to the question was, but I wanted to make sure that I knew what they thought the answer to the question was, so I clicked on a hint and a video of me popped up. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, our planetary defense officer, Lindley Johnson, he also took it and, and he passed. That is, great to hear. <laughs> that is great to hear. I feel like, I need a hint. Oh, there's me. Tell me what's up. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Well, we have um, DART is scheduled to make an impact with its uh, target asteroid in the fall of 2022. After that happens, scientists and astronomers around the world will work to verify if the redirection tests work. Let's go back out to Raquel Villanueva for more on this. Raquel? 
Thanks, Daryl. I'm here with DART Coordination Lead Nancy Chabot to find out what is next. Thanks for joining us, Nancy. Oh, thanks for having me. Great launch, huh? It's beautiful. So what is the first thing your team will do after impact? We will be doing so much. I mean, first thing will be the Draco images that are streaming back one per second. And this is the first time we get to see what this asteroid looks like. And so I guarantee the team at APL is going to have these images up on the big screen, seeing what the shape is, seeing what the geology is, seeing where we actually hit. You know, but then there's more. There's Lychia Cube, and those images are actually going to take uh, a few days or weeks to come back, and they're going to show us the ejecta from the collision. And the telescopes are going to get right to work, too, here on the Earth. They're going to be turning their gaze and trying to figure out how much we actually deflected this asteroid. And that's going to go on for months. And then we've got a bunch of people with state-of-the-art models who are going to model the impact, model the ejecta, model the dynamics, and they're going to use the inputs from the images and the observations and all come together. It's going to be a really, really busy time. Sounds like it. And can you tell me why the impact, the timing of the impact is important? Yeah, it's really interesting because September 2022 is the perfect time to do this. So Didymos and uh, and uh, the Earth, they both go around the sun, right? But it actually takes about a little over two years for Didymos. So sometimes the Earth and Didymos are on like the opposite sides of the sun and really far away from each other. But in September 2022, it's actually minimized. They're going to be the closest that they are for 40 years. And that's going to let the telescopes here on the Earth get the best data possible of how much we deflected this asteroid. Wow. And scientists around the world, will they be able to confirm your results? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually super happy we've got scientists around the world on the DART team. Um, and so this is an international team for an international issue, right? Like planetary defense is our whole planet. We're all on it together. And that's there. We've got obviously the Lichia Cube contributed by the Italian Space Agency. Um, we're also really working closely with the European Space Agency's HERA mission, which is going to rendezvous with the Didymo system in 2026. And it's going to be able to see the crater, get the mass, and it's really exciting because, you know, DART is just the start and then Hera will get there and these two missions combined will show us even more than anyone could do on their own. And it's just really a great example of international collaboration for this international issue. It really is. And what was it like seeing the launch today? Uh, it was really spectacular. I, you know, I didn't really know what to expect so much, um, but then when you just saw it like light up through the sky and sort of change the things and everybody erupts in the cheers, it's a, uh, it's really real, you know, and, uh, but in some ways this is just getting dart onto this next phase. I'm looking forward to these 10 months and then the collision and then everything I just described starts and we've got so much to look forward to. Busy time ahead. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Nancy. Thank you. This is great. Back to you, Daryl. All right. And as she mentioned, when dart is impacts the asteroid, the spacecraft, and the onboard camera will be completely destroyed. But we will see DART's last maneuver thanks to an Italian CubeSat that will jettison from DART 10 days before impact. For more on this, we are joined by Simone Parata of the Italian Space Agency. And we're going to talk about Lice Cube, which stands for Light Italian CubeSat for Imaging Asteroids. So how did this idea for a DART CubeSat actually come about? Uh, thank you. Uh, so the idea of CubeSat came about in the time frame of 2017. At the time, the Italian Space Agency was already running a project that is called Argo Moon, and it's a similar CubeSat that will fly on the Artemis 1 mission. So uh, this CubeSat will provide important information and images of the launcher. So we thought, why don't we propose a similar CubeSat that will uh, support the DART mission. Anyway, we were somehow, you know, contacted by NASA and then the, the idea came in this way and we started this new challenging project it's and we are very like, excited to be here. Yeah, it's like DART throwing out a, a, a cell phone to take a selfie right before it rams into an asteroid. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's okay, we still kind of sometimes refer to it as a selfie sat, but <laughs> but, but in, uh, or seriously, what, um, can you tell us more about Lichia Cube's scientific objectives? <laughs> All right. We will support DART. We are kind of witness of the uh, immediate effect of the impact because uh, later on, you know, the effect of the impact, yes, uh, will be measured by, from the Earth, by telescopes, but we will provide unique images. Yeah, this is Lucia Cube. It's going to, has been just uh, deployed from DART, 
so while DART is targeting the, and then impacting the asteroid, we will maneuver in a way that will allow us to pass in a safe distance, so not to be impacted by ejectors, but at the proper distance to have a good resolution of our images. That is super cool. Yeah, so the plumes is important information, yeah. and we will also provide information on the other side of uh, the asteroid that is not visible by DART, that is coming from just one direction. So us, can I use a small model that is... Uh, sure, what do you have? <laughs> I have with me just a small toy that my daughter did uh, with the Lego that looks bricks. Like Legos. <laughs> yes, they are Legos. But in particular, <laughs> they are the Legos that I received when I was a kid. Uh, they were wow. stored for 30 years, and now my daughter she is using. <laughs> so we're old Legos repurposed right. on the show today. You can I love see it. from the color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are not properly white. Anyway, <laughs> while Lichai Cube is approaching the scene, it's maneuvering and the velocity is, uh, is an issue because Dart uh, is intentionally very fast against the asteroid. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and we have limited resources on board as a CubeSat, so we cannot modify our velocity so much. So we'll be very fast while yeah. we are approaching the scene, okay. and we will try to be out of our, the plane, have a good illumination of the scene, and then we will look at the plume that will be generated, and we will maneuver, change the attitude in order to image the other side of the asteroid. That's fantastic. Not just getting the impact, but the other side. Yeah. And we and we showed that with Legos. It's my favorite part. <laughs> well, and, and as is great with the Legos, uh, using that, can you tell us what are the main components of Lichia Cube and how do they work? Sure. Lichia Cube is, is a 6 U cube set in size and it's a complete spacecraft. You can see it's equipped with all subsystems. Uh, um, the the core is made by the two instruments, the two cameras. One is with a, a narrow field of view and the other has a wider field of view. So they have complementary functions in the, in, the, you know, in the action. And real quickly, how close will uh, Leachy Cube come to the asteroid? Well, uh, we had a trade-off on this decision, and uh, in the end, the, this, the proper distance and the closest approach will be uh, around 55 kilometers. It is, again, a safe distance, but it's good enough to have a resolution on the surface of about one meter per pixel mm -hmm. that will allow us to have good information on, uh, also on the morphology of the surface, maybe the crater. The crater is not uh, completely sure that we can image because the plume can cover it. We can, when we need the proper time to allow the plume to be developed enough. So while we are uh, having our flyby, we can have a complete uh, modeling of how the materials will be uh, released. That's fantastic. Sumine Parada from the Italian Space Agency. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for bringing your Lego. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was great. It is uh, like a kind of uh, lucky charm for us. And uh, my daughter wants this okay. back, so I'll take it back to Italy. <laughs> All right, let's check in with Marie and Denton to find out more about spacecraft separation, guys. All right, thanks, uh, Daryl and Kelly. It was a very interesting uh, conversation. We are about uh, 45 seconds or so from spacecraft separation when the Falcon 9 second stage and DART will be uh, over the Indian Ocean near Madagascar. And then the job of the Falcon 9 rocket will be officially complete for this mission. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the job of Falcon 9 was to get dart on its way to the Didymo system. At this point, we've gotten enough velocity, enough speed to send dart off towards the Didymo system. And right now, well, we're in range of the ground station so we can get all the data from and so we can make sure we can actually capture the dart separation. separation command. confirmed. And we just heard the call out for spacecraft separation. You can see the video of the dart spacecraft on its way, heading on its way to the Didymo system. What a spectacular view of DART, yep. uh, just floating away from the Falcon 9 second stage. And you can see the sun off to the side there as DART drifts away from the Falcon 9 second stage. And so this officially begins uh, almost a year of cruise for the DART spacecraft uh, flying through uh, on its way to the Didymo system. And at the time that it impacts Dimorphos uh, in late September 2022 uh, is what we expect, uh, the Didymo system will be within 11 million kilometers of Earth. Um, again, 
to remind folks this this uh, system is does not pose any kind of threat uh, to Earth. This is purely a test, um, and so DART, uh, when it approaches, uh, will smash into Dimorphos, the small moonlet of Didymos, um, at 15,000 miles per hour. Just astonishing rate of speed. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the next thing that uh, we have to get through, obviously, spacecraft separation is is a huge milestone, but we are we're not um, out of the woods yet. We still have to get acquisition of signal from the DART spacecraft, and that takes a little bit more time, right, Dutton? Yeah, and at this point, the launch vehicle has done its job, and we just want to make sure we get we basically hear from the DART spacecraft, to make sure it's doing well. And if you think if you think about it, it's kind of like getting off of a roller coaster, right? You know, you step off the roller coaster, you know, you kind of steady yourself. You want to check your pockets, make sure you didn't lose anything along the along the way, make sure you're okay. Um, and that's basically what, what we're looking for from the DART spacecraft once it gets that acquisition of signal, because it's gonna kind of go through its self checks, make sure everything's okay, and then it's gonna send send word back to home, basically saying, "Hey, I'm doing all right." And that's what we're looking for, right? now and that's I mean because if we don't get that then it's kind of all for nothing right you want to make sure that the spacecraft is doing well after it's gone um, you know separated away from the launch vehicle and you've got grounds uh, ground stations uh all over the planet that are looking for this signal from DART. And right. we'll be trying to start picking that up very right. soon. Right. And sometimes it's not an exact, you know, it's not exact because sometimes the timing may vary. Once you get in range of certain ground stations, you know, there could be weather kind of impacting that signal strength, etc. So there are various factors that come into play. So, but we're expecting to get it um, coming up in a few minutes, but hopefully we'll get that so we can get good word that DART is doing well. Okay, and so there's a range uh, that we're that we're expecting um, acquisition of signal could be as early as around uh, T plus an hour and seven minutes. So that's um, nine or so minutes from now. Um, it could be as late as T plus one hour thirty four minutes. Like you said, it's not an exact science. Uh, we'll know when it happens. Uh, and we'll give confirmation as as soon as we hear it. Uh, but for now, we're going to keep an ear on things. And Daryl and Kelly, we will send it back to you. All right, Maria and Denton, thank you so much. What beautiful imagery seeing that DART spacecraft sailing off. Well, DART will be destroyed after it smashes into its target asteroid, but years from now, a new spacecraft will follow DART's path to the same double asteroid. Joining us now is Ian Carnelli, the European Space Agency's project manager for HERA. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, tell me a little bit about what HERA does and how it got its name. All right, so HERA will be launched in October 2024. Uh -huh. So a few years out, it's currently now in integration and uh, we'll launch it from Kourou and uh, arrive at Didymos in 2026, uh, around Christmas day. And our primary purpose is really to complete the investigation to understand what has happened during the and after the DART impacts, so understand the dynamics, uh, the, the geology, the, what the, the, the asteroid is made of. And the name is quite funny. Actually, we had a, an evening with the scientists and we were thinking about names and I only had a constraint from my boss saying we don't want acronyms for once. <laughs> so, uh, the so, idea... <laughs> yeah, and so it was a perfect choice, but it's because there are two exactly. aspects of this, right? What is this? Exactly. So these are the CubeSats. So here we'll bring with it two CubeSats, one called Milani after actually the scientists who brought up the name of the mission uh -huh. and the concept and Juventus. So the two CubeSats will perform scientific investigations. Here we're seeing the booms deploying from Juventus. That's actually a, a, a low frequency radar. What it does it's actually is, going down. is actually like a, a X-ray. We we'll want to understand what is the internal structure of the asteroid, to understand if there are voids or if it's a monolithic rock. How about that? Yeah, so imagine... Literally going into the, the crater that Dark created? Exactly, that's the purpose. That? And uh, so Hera comes after the goddess, the Greek goddess of marriage. And uh -huh. the idea being that despite being hit by Dart, the two asteroids will stay together. <laughs> so that was kind of the, uh, okay. the history behind the name. <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah, and we just got uh, Dart off the planet. Uh, and so why is it important now to, you know, a few years later for Hera to go and then follow up? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we are so excited about Dart. It was an awesome launch. And uh, we're all expecting beautiful uh, science data to come mm -hmm. next year. But then the, the purpose of Hera is really to complete the experiment, to get close and personal 
personal mm -hmm. and uh, get all of the science data that we need to, to actually calibrate our numerical impact codes, meaning that we can reproduce on our computer simulations exactly what happened during the dark impact. And that will allow us in the future to be able to design a planetary defense mission if we need to on another object. So we will have all of the models calibrated so that we can use it on another asteroid. All right, Ian Cornelli, fast wire signal from the DART spacecraft. And so let's take a look inside at the Mission Operations Center and the Johns Hopkins uh, University's Applied Physics Laboratory, if we have that. That's where, that's where the real work is going to start being done in terms of acquiring that signal. And in just a few minutes, we're expecting that DART team to do just that, acquire the signal. But as Marie and Denton mentioned, it's not an exact science. Mm. You know, we got to go through some stations to make sure we acquire that signal and get it in there. But you're pretty familiar, Kelly, with the people who are going to be in that room waiting for this signal to come in. Well, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office and the Planetary Science Division have been working with the Applied Physics Lab and with the uh, co-investigators at other, other institutions for, for a long time on this. And and yes, this, it, it's a mission, it's a task, people have their jobs that they need to do, but I mean, these are these are individuals who are really passionate about that, what they're doing, and so uh, yeah. uh, they're really taking this to heart, and, and, and I'm sure they're still on pins and needles as they work their way through this part of the mission. Speaking of uh, pins and needles. We, there we see the room there, as you can see at the lower uh, bottom of your screen, awaiting dart acquisition of signal. And that area right there is called the command pit uh, at APL. And, and so those folks are uh, patiently and intently listening for communication uh, from dart to the ground. So while we await that, let's send it over to Marie and Denton, who are monitoring the launch team communications as we await acquisition of signal. Uh, so right now, Daryl and Kelly, it's just a lot of waiting and listening. We're, there's almost no chatter uh, going on on the loops. Everyone is just kind of waiting with bated breath. At this point, we're at T plus one hour, four minutes, and counting. Uh, and just in these, these it, it all kind of comes down to these final minutes. When are we going to get that signal? Yeah. Um, years of work. Some of the people in this room, probably if not <laughs> if not all of them, have poured years of their life this is their life's work into this mission and so uh what's it like waiting for this confirmation yeah and, and so you know having been on the launch vehicle side and sitting on console and working this you know what you've been working years to kind of get to this point and as you mentioned the spacecraft team is in dedicate most of their careers uh, or, you know, their life's work to the spacecraft. So, you know, getting through the launch, you know, he's like, great, we had a great launch, everything went successful, but you want to make sure you get that confirmation from the spacecraft. So it's a little excitement that we got through the launch, but it's a little nervousness that we like, okay, we want to make sure the spacecraft is doing okay. And that, that, and so it's a mixture of excitement and nervousness at the same time. Yeah, and, you know, you mentioned nervousness, and in... Okay, we see some clapping. We haven't heard anything, so trying to see if we can find out if... Uh... So we're waiting to get positive confirmation that we've actually have got signal from the DART spacecraft. So we're just waiting to get word. If you're just joining us, this is a live view of the Mission Operations Center at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, this is where the spacecraft team is waiting to receive confirmation of acquisition of signal from the DART spacecraft currently on its way to the Did Didymos uh, asteroid system where we expect it will impact the moonlit dimorphos in late September of next year. And Denton, while we wait uh, to hear whether we have uh, acquisition of signal, I, I was going to mention 
you know, the teams rehearse this many, many times. There is, um, there are pages and pages of procedures that have to be followed down to the letter, and you go through everything a final time during the mission dress rehearsal. This team did that uh, less than a week ago uh, from the control rooms here in Vandenberg, uh, at Johns, at Johns Hopkins, um, all around the country. And this is the one thing that you can't really predict. You don't really know when it's going to happen. Right. So it all comes down to different the, the environments and different variables that play out on launch day. And uh, whether you're going to get that single early or whether you're going to get it later, you won't know until you get up there. So, mm-hmm. you know, rehearsals and, and practice is great for dealing with anomalies and, and things along those lines. But at the end of the day, you still you're 100% sure of when it'll actually happen until, you know, the launch, until launch day. And so at this point, we are officially inside that window uh, when we think we could get acquisition of signal. So it could happen at any moment. Right. And you can look in the room and you can kind of see that nervous energy of people just waiting to get that confirmation of spacecraft um, that, or I would say first signal from the spacecraft and make sure that the spacecraft is doing well. And then after that signal is acquired, there, I mean, there's even more to be done. Then, I mean, that's a that's a huge moment of yeah. celebration, sigh of relief. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done on the other yeah. side of that. Absolutely. So that's when the dart, the dart team, the spacecraft team, that's when their work really begins. The launch vehicle team pretty much did all their work, uh, kind of leading up to spacecraft separation. Now it's time for the dart team to kind of really uh, moving forward on the operational side of, of their their mission. Um, at this point, because, you know, they spent years developing the technology, building the spacecraft, and now, since we've ha- had a successful launch, the operational side of their, their mission really begins. Mm-hmm. So we just got confirmation that we do have acquisition of signal which is great news that the spacecraft is being able to talk to the team on the ground. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Huge news. Um, it's, it's a process, uh, from this point, the solar arrays on dart, uh, will we'll still have to unfurl. Uh, that, that process does not begin until, uh, about T plus, uh, one hour and 42 minutes. So that's still quite a ways away. Um, and that, process once the first one begins to unfurl that happens uh, very gradually and then uh, it's almost an hour before the second one is is fully unfurled and the span of those um, stretches fully out into space um, each one reaching almost 30 feet um, in either direction and they are Okay, and uh, just to finish that thought, they are three times more powerful than standard solar arrays. Uh, we've, we've just heard that uh, NASA launch manager Tim Dunn is, is standing by uh, with Daryl and Kelly to speak to them about uh, the success so far in the DART mission now that we have confirmation of acquisition of signal. So Daryl and Kelly, uh, Denton and I will sign off from here and we will send it back to you. All right, thank you, Marie and Denton. Great job out there and congratulations is in order for for launch services program. Tim Dunn joining us here on set. Just popped in, fresh from the control room. Yes. How'd it go from your perspective? Oh, it went great. Just terrific. Uh, we got it all settled in about three and a half hours before T0. And uh, we had a, a couple of minor issues uh, with a little bit with the pad, a few items with the rocket. But it's amazing, Daryl, to watch the integration of the NASA team and the SpaceX team work through anomalies and issues to make sure that we are tracking to that precious one second instantaneous window that we had to hit. 
Obviously, we had perfect weather today, so that was not a player at all. Uh, no range instrumentation issues at all. So uh, it was just a terrific countdown, and any countdown that ends in a successful launch followed by spacecraft separation <laughs> is a great day. Absolutely, and what a show out there outside as well. Clear skies, you don't get that all the time in Vandenberg. That's correct. You see it straight up, and there were some great camera views as well. Yes, yes, we, uh, we got a peek out of the window at the uh, SpaceX facility and uh, got to see probably about the first 30 seconds of flight. Looked gorgeous from North Vandenberg. Nice. Oh, fantastic. And one second launch window and um, no rest for the weary. It's been quite uh, an end of the year for you here with lots of launches. How, what has that been like? <laughs> it's been very busy. Uh, you guys know uh, we started off just two months ago, Landsat here at Vandenberg. A month after that, uh, middle of October, Lucy back on the East Coast. And here we are, uh, you know, right before Thanksgiving with a successful DART launch. And uh, we turn right around, 16 days from now, we'll be launching Ixby on a Falcon 9 from Kennedy Space Center. And then just a few more months after that, a GOES launch early in 2022. So uh, just a very busy time, but a very exciting time for Launch Services Program. Well, it certainly has been the end of the year. Lots of launches, as you mentioned. Got to get going in the early part of next year as well. Yes. But uh, you get to enjoy this one now a little bit. And uh, congratulations to you and the team. Uh, well, thank you so much. It means a lot to be able to launch uh, on the 23rd of November and be able to get a lot of folks on airplanes tomorrow so they can be home with their families. You betcha. I'm one of those. So thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, our coverage of the DART mission is coming to a close, but... Uh, uh, you can keep track of DART and get updates on Twitter. Just go to at Asteroid Watch on all of the platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So thank you for watching our NASA coverage of the DART launch from the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. We want to give all uh, our guests a special thanks for participating in the show. And a special shout out to my co-host, Kelly Fast. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Daryl. This was so much fun. <laughs> Congratulations, and we look to hear more from you in the fall of next year. Ready to cheer on the team. They've been fabulous. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. So we leave you now with a replay of the DART launch from right here at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Good night, everyone, and remember to keep looking up. T minus 15. 10. 9, Nine 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and DART on NASA's first planetary defense test to intentionally crash into an asteroid. So we're getting a nice view of the onboard cameras from the Falcon 9. So you can see it looking towards the first, the, the aft end of the first stage. And you can see those engines coming to life. Stage one chamber pressure is normal. And Falcon 9 will be reaching max Q in just seconds, the moment of peak mechanical stress on the rocket. And, and here in the Mission Data Center, we can feel...